So I'm writing this on the same day that I uploaded the first episode. Uh, the upload went live at 3am and I'm writing this at 10am. I'd planned this to all be one video, but 8,500 words in three hours is a great way to get a hand cramp. Once the pilot and episode one review were done, editing it together into a version that the backend robots liked took about three hours on its own, just exporting, waiting to upload, waiting to process, and while it processed it would send me a sorry your video is dead on arrival message, and I'd have to note down where the error was, open my editing software, fix it, and start the process again. With upload and export taking upward of 40 minutes each time. Eventually, after four re-edits, I got it. That's why you keep seeing cuts to black, especially in the uh, Amazon section of that vid. Sleeping at 4am is going to do wonders for my current eye twitch. I've been sleeping at 1am for the past few days, down from 3am, and now this video may have thrown that off. But it's worth it. I've not felt so creatively refreshed that I just write nearly 9,000 words non-stop in an afternoon. In that first hour of upload, the video got four likes, and by the time I woke up this morning, it already had a comment. Thank you, Larry the Eggman, for your confidence and enthusiasm. These may sound like doing the numbers kind of hype, but the most my videos tend to get is about 100 views over the course of months, so seeing four in one hour is good stuff for my channel. Whilst I wrote this on the same day of uh, releasing it, I finished writing it the next day, and I'm currently recording it that same day, so one day after upload, it's got 27 views, and that's a pretty good sign. I would maybe get more traffic if I were allowed to post that video to the Hasbin Hotel subreddit, but they don't allow self-promotion there. So, in the spirit of all this, if you liked the last video, and this one, please share it around. Like it and subscribe, and uh, that way you'll see the next two videos. Comment below your own fan theories, favourite parts, or opinions on character designs, that sort of thing. You gotta play the game, you know. Anyway, let's get into episode two. This is probably one of my favourite episodes, maybe even my favourite episode of the bunch. I'd say out of the four I've seen already, episode one is probably my least favourite, even if it's still an amazing episode. And I really like episode three, despite the massive flaws that I'll get into. Episode two has none of these caveats, really. It's fun and addictive. Episode 2. Radio Killed the Video Star. That's a nice Buggles reference. Plot. The episode opens with Charlie panicking about the shorter time frame between now and the next extermination, expecting the angels to keep shortening the time frame between them, and wondering how many souls she'll be able to save in these tinier and tinier windows. She's calmed down by Vaggy. Angel comments about how little chance the hotel had to begin with, and mid-rant we see his phone blowing up with messages from Val. Here's a screenshot of the phone, just so we can read the messages. They're not... they're not good. He shows Charlie a news site, and Val messages again, seemingly putting off both Charlie and Angel. This is important for episode 4. Vaggy begins to comment about how sinners being so desperate about this perceived end of the world may drive them into the hotel but this is the last we see of this idea. In the next few episodes, no one else comes to the hotel that was driven there by the extermination, and every time they go out to recruit, they fail. After a comment about sinners not showing up on their doorstep, one does. Serpentius is back to beef, or I guess venison, with Alistair. There's more of Nifty being nifty here. <gasps> Ooh, he's a bad boy. Alistair again talks about how forgettable Pentius is, and the snake boy talks about how he seeks validation from the V's. Alistair, when Nifty asks who they are, comments that they're no one important. We then cut to the V's tower, where Voxtech is selling a new drone, and we see the hypnotic effect of the media that's produced by the syndicate's ostensible kingpin, Vox. He is seemingly the TV demon to Alistair's radio demon, and he has the power to hypnotically influence people using his nifty code Gias eye. He also seems to have the power to manipulate electricity, wirelessly controlling digital technology, and being able to travel through devices and into the wires. From a room above, one of the other V's, Velvet, calls down to Vox, telling that Valentino, the final V, and Angel's boss, is throwing a hissy fit and needs Vox to handle the situation. Vox comments that this is a fairly regular occurrence. He comes up from his nerve centre and is accosted by news reporters, wanting to know his opinion on the recent extermination deadline change. 
He runs a well-rehearsed spiel about how his company is always looking out for health residents and announces an angel security system that his company will begin working on. Although, he just made up this idea a few seconds ago, showing off his hypnotism powers to get them all to shut up. Vox seems to be the type to always have an answer ready on the spot and knows exactly what to say in any situation. His cool demeanour belies a confidence and control over others that's unwavering, even without using his power. This, as we see later in the episode, is not the case, but is rather the impression he gives to others and tries to convince himself of. He snaps quickly upstairs through a security camera and meets face to face with Velvet. You may remember her and the other Vs from this clip in the pilot. It's very strange how different she looks, but also the bubbly, hyper-anime fangirl air that this clip presents is also totally changed in the show. She's gone from being this seemingly energetic hype girl in the pilot to being this weary, put-upon TV manager. She's one of the only characters in the show that I've yet to find a liking for 100%, but she does have her moments here and there. Plus, she's meant to be unlikable. She seems to be the demon of fashion, or trends or something, and has the ability to change a person's appearance, or at least their clothes, at will. This is all we get of her abilities in the show so far. One thing I do like about her is her little eye flare when she talks about burning clothing that she hates. I also noticed a kind of walkie-talkie sound effect between each of her comments here, which cements her as the backstage staff for the V's media empire to me. Ugh. No. Unacceptable. You're fired. What is this? Vox appears to talk to her. We find out that Val ripped a model into pieces with his bare hands, and we get confirmation that demons can pull themselves back together unless killed by an exorcist blade. We also see some of Vox's TV effects coming through, but unlike Alistair, it seems to come in when he's especially fake or super angry. It seems to be tied to his negative emotions. Uh, and uh, what's got him so out of sorts today? Interestingly, the dress she picks out for this model looks a lot more like her original design from the pilot than we ended up getting in the show. Now Vox goes up to calm down Val, and we finally see what this guy's like after all the teasing in the Addict video and the other media around the show. I'll be honest, I was expecting Val and Angel's situation to be very similar to Mammon and Fizzaroli's situation in Hell of a Boss, with Mammon using manipulation and guilt trips, other mind games like that, to keep Fizz in control, and with Fizz relying on Mammon for validation, Val is... I'm gonna fuck everyone in that rancid shithole, I swear to God. Val, I didn't know that... When I say you are fucking 20 guys before lunch, you say... Much more direct. Valentino is a ticking time bomb, with mood swings that are psychotic, violent outbursts, and anger issues that seem to imply that he's rarely the calm, cool and imposing figure that he is in the Addict video. Probably because we're seeing him from Angel's point of view in that one. But this shows him more as a petulant child with a gun and a god complex. Here we also see one of the only connections to Hell of a Boss, these Jester robots. This seems to be some kind of female variant of the Fizzbot, but the jestery lines of this design look like it might be at least a variant of the same bot, if not a Vox Tech knockoff of Mammon's IP. We know Hell does this a lot from the Hell of a Boss episode where we see Lululand. Val is upset that Angel moved and calls him a lot of very unsavoury names, while Vox watches in annoyance, especially after losing his phone. Val goes over to pick out which gun is more attractive so he can shoot up Charlie's hotel, and Vox warns him that he's not going over there. Val isn't in the mood to listen, though, and here we see the first intimation of Vox's true persona as he blows up at Val. Just one shouted word, but it's enough to notice. Plus the TV effect comes in here. God. Val. <laughs> Vox uses a very cunning series of words to play off Val's vanity, and uh, his need for control as well, saying that it wouldn't be a good look for the Vs if it appeared like he couldn't control his staff and had to lose his mind to keep them in line. He also mentions the contract Angel signed, which means that regardless of where he lives, Val still owns him. This calms Val down somewhat, and being told that Vox is going to send up the lowest earners from the company for Val to shoot makes him even happier. When he's had a second to think about things, and has his mind on someone else for a change, Val remembers to tell Vox about the hotel's benefactor, Alistair. 
This really shakes Vox. And we finally see the true man underneath the presenter persona that he has. He tells Val that that should have been the first thing that he heard upon walking into the room, and Val begins to toy with Vox, playing off of his anger. We cut to a security drone watching Alistair throw around Pentius again. Here, Angel tells Charlie that Pentius can take a beating, which does make sense since Angel only fought him about a week ago. Pentius is thrown out of the airship, and Alistair calls it another forgettable experience, and we also see more of Alistair not showing up right on camera. Then, Pentius rips Alistair's coat. Bad idea. More on this in a bit, but I think it's a pretty important moment. Alistair is about to go and get his coat fixed at the tailor when Vaggy tells him that they need him there to do his job at the hotel. Angel specifies that they need to fix the wall that Pentius broke, so Alistair conjures up a series of voodoo shades to do some work. Val doesn't like that Angel is flirting with the hired help for free, but Vox is still caught up on Alistair. One thing I very nearly forgot to mention in this script is that Vox drops the bomb that the amount of time that Alistair's been missing from hell is seven years. I told you to keep that number in mind. The reason I forgot to include it is because I thought this was revealed in the next episode, but no. Vox tells us that Alistair's been missing from hell for seven years. Who else has been missing from hell for seven years? Lilith. Oof, how long has it been now? Not that long. Only seven years. Yeah, I thought he was gone for good too. It's been seven years! That can't be a coincidence. Seven years is such a specific number. It's not a good round number. And as far as we're aware, nothing specific happened seven years ago in hell. So, what, if you'll forgive the pun, the hell? There must be some connection. The same event that drove Lilith away is the same one that drove Alistair away. Maybe they're both doing something. Maybe Lilith is going to return sometime soon. Maybe both of them knew each other. Maybe there's, there's some crazy thing like Lilith is Alistair. I doubt it. But, like, th when you have such specific frames of time in a show that is known to have interesting lore implications and consistency throughout all the years of its production, you, you gotta question, and that's probably the biggest lore reveal in this whole thing, really. <laughs> I was gonna kind of make it more hype when I wrote about it in the next episode. I, I'm, this is all off the cuff right now because I completely forgot to write this in the script until editing and seeing that Vox specifically said that he's been gone for seven years. So um, forgive the random tirade. This was all going to be a bit more organized. Um, but that is a ridiculously significant piece of law that we can't quite decode right now, but it is quite clearly going to be important in the future, and we just have to kind of sit and wait, which I guess the franchise fandom is very used to doing by now. So, buckle in, fellas. Val teases Vox about Alistair, almost beating him in the past, and the musical vamp for the next song begins under this tirade. This is one of the best things the show does, and I'll get into that in the next episode more. This song is something I never thought I needed. A villain song, but with a little twist that I'll mention in a sec. The song goes over Vox thinking his new status quo of visual media is superior to Alistair's outdated radio shtick. We see Vox singing in an unusual meter, but very fast and always clapping back at Alistair despite him not even saying anything. It really reads to me as a man with a point to prove. Just look at his expression here with the other Vs. It says everything. Then... Alistair begins broadcasting. This is the thing that I mentioned earlier, what I never knew I needed. A villain song interrupted by another villain song, where two villains face off musically. Alistair comments on Vox's insecurity, and specifically says he'd be powerless without Val and Vel. Considering TV is just kind of an empty box without programming on, it kind of makes sense. And you can say the same thing about radio, but audio is so heavily ingrained into everything we consume, even TV, that radio has nothing to prove, and has the inherent charm and clout without needing to chase every fad like TV. Alistair reveals that Vox's insecurity comes from asking Alistair to join the Vs, and him denying the offer, which causes Vox to have a full-blown meltdown live on TV. 
We get this wonderful shot of hell going dark as Alistair continues his broadcast, showing all of this particular ring. The hotel on the outskirts, and the two moons in the sky, one of which may be heaven itself. We'll have more on that later. We can see V Tower, which is the first place to lose power. The angelic embassy with a countdown clock in the centre. And what seems to be some strange U-shaped building glowing red with a big covered building outside, like a circus tent or a pagoda. We go back to the initial tempo of the song as Alistair reprises the intro, threatening hell and the V's, using Vox's line of I'll make you wish you had stayed gone, and flipping it by saying that he'll make them wish that he'd stayed gone. We see Alistair's bestial, demonic form slip out here. We finally see him. Not Alistair. This is the radio demon. And he's back. Vox whimpers like a baby. <laughs> the three Vs have a meeting discussing what to do about Alistair. Val makes a joke about putting something in the Hasbin Hotel, since that's how he keeps his crew in line. Dodging the SA connotations of that line, we move on to Vox, who says that a man on the inside is a good idea. But Vel says that they need someone who be desperate and pathetic enough to go somewhere like that, who has no connection to them. Vox gets an idea. Charlie and Vaggy return to the hotel empty-handed after their recruitment drive. Just as Angel is telling them that no one will want to join the hotel, Pentius appears on the doorstep requesting amnesty and wanting to improve. Angel doesn't quite like the idea, and neither does Vaggy, but on Charlie's insistence, she relents, claiming that he's not a threat with or without his weapons. Charlie shows him round, and her enthusiasm and Vaggy's babe when calming her down just add to their adorable vibes. Charlie says she's overexcited because they finally have a resident who's interested in their endeavour, and Vaggy specifically says that Angel hasn't once tried to change. This exchange leaves Angel rather morose and we'll see why soon. Nifty comes in and sees Pentius. The bad boy is back! Never leave me again. <sighs> yep, she's still Nifty, all right, as Charlie says, around 80% harmless. Alistair appears and comments that he finally remembers Pentius, since he ripped his coat. Pentius is not too happy about this, despite his validation being exactly what he wants. Maybe it's the whole threat of death thing. Hmm. Charlie uses this as a chance to teach Pentius about forgiveness, and Pentius apologises, giving Alistair back the piece of his coat that he ripped off. Alistair comments that not many people have been able to take even this much from him, and that the tuft of cloth must mean a lot to Pentius, which makes sense since he actually kept it. In order to screw with him further, immediately after saying how much the keepsake must mean to Pentius, he burns it. Whilst this is certainly more important to Alistair than anything else, screwing with Sir Pentius might actually be the way that Alistair has of deflecting from the fact that he's genuinely impressed at Sir Pentius for catching him off guard by being so pitiful. I love this interaction. They all have a silly, happy, clappy intro session where Angel isn't really into it. Even Vaggy's a little into it, even if it's just a mess with Angel. Then they do a play, written poorly, by Charlie that casts Angel as an uncool, spaced-out crackhead trying to drag the innocent around him down to his level. The praise heaped on Pentius after his admittedly spirited performance adds to this air of dismissing Angel. Comedy comes in threes, and so does tragedy. This one-two-three hit combo to Angel's mental state causes him to retreat to his room. Here he listens to the manic voice messages of Val, flitting between love and desperate anger constantly. The barrage of emotions builds up in Angel until Val finally seems to get his anger under control, and uses it smartly to diminish Angel, calling him addict trash who will never change. This is why Vaggy's words hurt him so much earlier. This is why the casting in the play wasn't just comedically overwrought and poorly written. This is why everyone praising Pentius for his perceived enthusiasm to change caught him so badly. Vaggy was basically directly quoting his abuser to him. Not even Fat Nuggets' his pet demon pig can cheer him up now. So he finds comfort at the bottom of the bottle, the habit he's shown throughout the show, pilot and music video, and we have more of an insight into why. In his drunken stupor, he stumbles upon Pentius setting up a V camera in the library. He calls out Pentius, but Pentius calls him possibly the worst thing he could have called him in Angel's fragile emotional state. I don't know what you're talking about. 
Horbug. Causing a fight. Turns out Penchers can mesmerise, though, and calls off Angel just long enough for Charlie and Vaggy to wake up and investigate the noise. Angel calls Penchus a traitor, and when he tries to cozy up to the girls, Angel points out the camera. Penchus instantly cracks and calls Vox for immediate evacuation. Seeing how pathetic Penchus is, and how quickly he got caught, Vox tells him to go commit not live, and Penchus lies down subserviently to acquiesce to this request. Vaggy goes in to fulfil this request when Charlie stops her and offers Penchus a welcoming hand beginning a song about how forgiveness and a well-meaning apology can begin one's journey to redemption. Angel and Vaggy would rather just kill him, but Charlie says that they've all been in his shoes, or tail, I guess, and have made mistakes. This may in future episodes resonate with them both, especially Angel, and the next episode does show him warming up to Pentius. I hated that song! Why are you so lame? Not a bad boy. Nifty still nifty, everyone. The group then go back into the main hotel, with Pentius seemingly staying there because Vox was right that he is pathetic and desperate enough to do so, and his loneliness and Charlie's forgiving and friendly demeanour has won him over. Unless he and Vox planned this. Pentius is noticeably melodramatic at the best of times, so I can't tell if he's genuine or not, and, and this may all be a setup. but either way it's adorable for now. I really do hope Pentius is genuine, though, especially when you see how he is in the next episode with everyone else. Alistair emerges from the shadows to taunt Vox for his failure, crushing the watch that Pentius used to communicate with Vox. Strangely, we don't see what happens to the camera, but I'm assuming it's also disposed of. And that's episode two. Wow, <laughs> this was a very fun episode, so let's get into lore implications. Firstly, the interplay within the media circuit of the Vs is interesting. Their, or rather Vox's, feud with Alistair tells us a lot about Vox and Alistair as characters. It really paints Vox as a powerless and insecure person, and only holding things together through his power of hypnosis and threat of violence, which is mostly carried off by other people anyway, in his employ. He immediately feels threatened by Alistair, and knows the implications of him cuddling up with the royals. Valentino is seemingly more interested in personal attacks or things that he perceives as such, for example Angel becoming more independent of him, and Velvet's more interested in the day-to-day -day running of the Empire rather than how it's going overall. We'll see in the next episode that she is involved in the bigger picture, but it seems as though she's only interested in this sort of thing when she's not rushing around getting everything sorted for the other two. She is an interesting case study to dive into. She's very different from how she came across in the pilot, both visually and personality-wise. Vox is also not quite what I expected, considering his insecurity. As I've also mentioned, I wasn't exactly expecting Val to be this powder keg, kind of a, a bull in a china shop vibe. The interplay between them is amazing. I have to admit, I loved watching Vox bring Val down to a reasonable level. Once he's calm, though, we see the scheming and cerebral element of Val that gave Angel that scathing voice message, as he begins probing Vox for weakness through his hatred of Alistair. But even then, he can scarcely keep his anger focused for a second before getting distracted with Angel again. It's a very interesting dynamic. In order, Vel seems to be the most put together, able to bring about her rage and hatred when she needs to put people in their place, as we'll see in episode 3, and she's not ruled by her emotions like the other two. The way she figures things out so quickly in the next episode makes me wonder if her comments in that episode that she's the backbone of the Vs isn't just her hyping herself up. Maybe I'll come to like her more as her cerebral attitude begins to come out. Next, we have Vox, who always has the right thing to say and the right face to wear, but that always only turns out to be nine times out of ten. And all it takes is frustration at Val, or hearing about Alistair for him to blow up or even meld down. Finally on the scale is Valentino, the most out of control of all of them, and seemingly the most petulant. While he is quite pathetic on the quiet, I wouldn't want to be the one to tell him that. His unpredictability and proven strength makes him rather imposing. While it seems like he has a lot to prove, and a lot of petty control issues and little niggles in the back of his mind that would imply that he's really kind of useless without guidance, he actually has the strength, confidence, and gall to back it up. I can see why Angel has a hard time saying no to him. 
Pentius is a snake through and through, a slithery character who you have a hard time trusting, but an easy time loving. He comes off as lovably pathetic and needlessly melodramatic, and I unfortunately have no idea how much of it is an act. I really do hope he's not a double agent. Those are all the new characters that we meet in this episode, but seeing this shot of hell opens up interesting lore-related questions. What is this angelic moon? Is this heaven, or an angel watching over hell? If either is the case, what's this moon? Is this where Lucifer lives? In this shot we can see the hotel, the tower, the heaven embassy, but what's this? And is this large, glass-fronted building the one where the overlords meet in episode 3? Where are the lifts to the other rings that we see in Hell of a Boss? I think that's all the major lore implications from this episode. We don't see much of Vox's empire, just that he controls the media, at least in this ring, and that he may be somewhat of a sham in both his persona and business practices, as he makes up new scammy ideas on the spot and might be ripping off Mammon's fizzbots. I would like to know how the V's fell in with each other. Presumably it was a mutual business decision, but the tenuous and frail situation that they're in, only strengthened and held together by familiarity and profit, is very interesting. Well, I guess you know what they say about familiarity. I'd also like to know just what happens when Vox has his meltdown. Like, is it because he's connected to the power grid, and he's using so much power getting mad that he blows the whole city's power? We see the other Vs getting shocked as if there's a power surge. Is his influence so great that if he shuts down, so does all of the electronics in hell? Are there even electronics in hell? Like, not the devices. We know they have TVs and phones, but are they electronic? What powers them? I also wonder if Vox was actually the one that shut everything down in this meltdown, considering that he's awake and functioning by the end of Alistair's broadcast, so he couldn't have fully broken down. Is the presence of a demon lord enough to power some systems, like Vox's TVs and Alistair's radio? It seems that Alistair doesn't need his staff to transmit, and yeah, there may be a mic on the desk, or, or both of his mics can hear him from where he's standing, but it just seems more like he's projecting his influence into hell. How are Vox's monitors still on after the power surge? Is it this energy that demons produce that I've theorised here? Is that why he plugs into the power grid, so he can project his energy? Or is it so that he can supplant the energy that he can't create enough of? Is Alistair so powerful in comparison to him that he doesn't need that same connection? So many questions about this one scene that we can't answer yet. Production. The animation in this episode has no problems that I noticed. Besides maybe the fact that Vox appeared in front of this radio and then is gone in the next shot. Like, it's the same window. Is it more that he's appearing for us and not the sinners, like these shots earlier where he's fighting with Alistair but we know it's not actually happening, like a representation of him trying to hide his shame instead of it being physical. Either way. The design in this episode is great. Since we see a lot of Vox and V Tower, it's nice to see a change from the usual red palette, with a lot more blue tones. It kind of speaks to Vox's ego too, as the other two members of the Vs are very red-coded, but a lot of the tower is blue. Speaking of visual design, I quite like the visual elements in this musical number. It gives us more of an idea of the interplay between Alistair and Vox than just the lyrics alone do. Notice how much of Vox's different personalities it takes to cover Alistair in this scene, and yet he still can't quite get him off the screen totally. Alistair's demonic form is very fun to see here, and I'd like to dive into a little aside that I've noticed about a lot of demons, especially the lords. They seem to have this red stuff that seeps from their mouth when they get into things. Even Vox, despite his head being a TV. Either his head is somewhat biomechanical and this seepage is more bio than mechanical, or he programmed it to look more like the other demons. It's really odd to think about, and I wonder if there's any lore implications. I'd like to see a bit more of Alistair and Pentius. Their interplay may be interesting now that they're not fighting, you know? I'd like to think that Alistair would one day come to at least mildly respect Pentius for being able to tear his coat. We see his respectful relationships with the other demons in the next episode, where I get to speculate more about Al and the other demon overlords. Pentius and Charlie's song is a lot more generic than Vox and Alistair's. I think the visuals are too. Beautiful, don't get me wrong, same with the music, but I could also put these visuals into a lot of different emotional songs and get the same effect. Although Vaggy and Angel having this evil aura here is quite fun. 
I also like seeing Vaggie and Charlie in casual clothing. I love Charlie's bed head here. I, I don't know why. In this episode, we see more detail of the bar area that implies that it's either summoned by Alistair on top of the hotel itself, or ripped from another building and placed over this concierge desk. It looks separate, and almost like Alistair is constantly running like a background process of his voodoo to keep the hotel replete with alcohol. It's an interesting choice. This episode's design work also makes me realise just how aquatic this show and hell of a is. Crimson's Mafia and Hell of a Boss is almost entirely staffed by sharks, and the Club Angel goes to in episode 4 is full of sharks too. Vox's staff are frequently aquatic themed, and he's got a massive shark tank around his meeting room and below his nerve center, possibly the same shark tank. The voice work for the main cast is still on the same level of amazing quality, there's nothing new there, although we don't hear a word from Husk in this episode. Alex Brightman, much like his performance of Adam and Fizzaroli, is great as Sir Pentius. He brings both the melodramatic bombast and the snivelling patheticness that Pentius needed. He toes the line of annoyance, knowing when to pull it back away from the line and when to cross it for full effect. As such, he has a level of vocal control that I really do envy. Christian Ball, as Vox, is awesome. He has the same presenter energy as Talai, Tomar, and Bosco, but puts his own spin on it. Instead of a subpar newscaster like Tomar's Tom Trench, and instead of a mid-century, obnoxiously captivating radio presenter like Talai and Bosco's Alistair, Ball has this charming and energetic voice that fits Vox well, just enough of a hint behind the charisma of the character's inherent BS. His performance alone lets us know that he can't be trusted, even though he sounds confident and magnetic. Although, don't put a magnet near Vox. Lily Cooper as Velvet... I still don't know how to spell this, by the way. Amazon X-Ray says Velvet, but the has-been fandom always spells it Velvet. I've been spelling it and saying it in, in different ways throughout this entire episode. The same story goes for Nifty. Does it have two Fs? Anyway, Lily Cooper brings a world-weary yet energetic power to Velvet that it's hard to balance. It's... <clears throat> The best way I can describe it is that she sounds like she's powered off of one hour of sleep and ten Red Bulls. The exact kind of energy that you expect from an overworked TV producer. I imagine a lot of the inspiration for her performance comes from seeing such managers storming around behind the curtain, coffee in hand, ready to throw it at the first stage hand to dare give them bad news. It's a perfect voice of Val. I will admit her accent is strangely out of place in Hell. I've not seen many Brits in this show or the other one yet and certainly none with a more working-class accent. It's refreshing, and jarring, at the same time, but she is meant to be a jarring character, more like to butt into a conversation with her own thoughts than wait for you to finish your turn. Joel Perez as Valentino captures the perfect Hispanic bratty gay friend vibe that Val needed, but is able to capture the scheming and threat that he needed to, making it known that this should not be your bratty gay friend. He is... Not performatively aggressive, he will literally tear you limb from limb. That kind of bratty gay friend. And Perez lets us know that with his vocal performance. He's equally capable to pull off petulant bouts of screaming rage with clingy vibes and seething, plotting, brutal warlord energy. The writing's wonderful here. I loved seeing the interplay between the Lords in the V Tower, I loved seeing this moment between Pentius and Alistair, and I love the subtle writing around Angel's trauma, and that it doesn't resolve here. He doesn't let anyone in enough to console him by the end of the episode, and he's still in the throes of his trauma. That's fitting for his character. In a lesser show, we'd have seen the I'm not a traitor, Angel's being petty cliche in this scene, but this one doesn't pull that, and is very logical about how the characters should act. I like that a lot. Overall, this is my favourite episode of the show so far. Join me next time for another one I really love to watch, but the one with the biggest flaws that I've been teasing about for the last two episodes now.